and morning everybody um, I'm going to share with you some ideas this morning and hopefully you can steal some of them and take them back to your workplace in terms of how you're currently doing workplace well-being now back in 2023 the CIPD did a report they do uh, these annual well-being reports in collaboration with with Simply Health as a health insurance organization and they spoke to about 918 organizations so 918 organizations in the uk of all sizes so from small to large across all industries across all sectors to get a real a real cross-section of responses and it covered about five and a half million employees as well and they had some really interesting findings now i'm sure some of you have probably read the cipd uh, workplace wellbeing report but for those of you who haven't i'm just going to share a few of the little bits out, out from that that jumped out at me and it'd be interesting to get some of your thoughts on some of these ideas as well so i'm just going to share them on my screen now and you should be able to see those any second now now, just have a quick look at this first one that I've pulled out from the from the report. And this talks about where we are in terms of workplace absence. So just have a quick read of that for me. So what the CIPD are saying from their report then, again, of these, this is a cross section of 918 businesses, about six and five and a half million in, employees. The absence is the highest it's been in over a decade. So workplace absence is the highest it's been for 10 years. So back in 2019, the average uh, average amount of uh, days per employee per year was 5.8. Now it's 7.8. Yes, we've had COVID, which has, has influenced that, but things are going in the wrong direction. It seems quite clear. Things are going in the wrong direction in terms of workplace absence and workplace well-being. Now, this is just another quote I pulled out about the fact that so many of businesses just like yourselves are doing a great job we're really trying to do these things trying to really make it happen but the return isn't quite there so why is this what's happening all these resources that are going into workplace well-being why aren't businesses getting the benefit that they should be getting from them there's something maybe is not quite gelling not quite working otherwise we wouldn't have the highest absence rates that we've had in a decade now just to let you know the, the the top three reasons for those those absences were musculoskeletal so we're talking about you know back and neck injuries that sort of thing mental health and then general illness so musculoskeletal mental health and general illness and one of the conclusions in the foreword from the uh, from the CIPD was what you can see on your screen right now So organizations, the CIPD suggests that organizations take a systematic and preventative approach, a systematic and preventative approach to how they do things, because spending this money is great, but we need to be seeing the results from that expenditure. We need to be seeing a return on not only the money, but also the time invested. So we need to be seeing that return on investment. So what I want to talk to you about today is hopefully give you some ideas around how to make this systematic and preventative approach more of a reality okay now just tell you a bit about me yes laura introduced me and thanks for that laura it's very kind of you i'm a, I'm a wellness educator i've been in the world of well-being since around 2011. i originally started out as a personal trainer specializing in women's weight loss and doing health coaching around lifestyle sleep nutrition all that sort of stuff my aim was to help people particularly it was women at the time to lead healthier lifestyles and i'm going to incorporate some of what i've taught people over the years into what I talked to you about today as well. Now, I've had my own challenges in terms of mental health over the years, and that's what led me to start working in the corporate world, working particularly with managers, which is where I've been over the last eight years, helping managers around mental health, particularly the conversations, the awareness. Um, but what I've realized in the last few years is that it's great teaching managers how to spot the signs, how to signs post someone to EAP, how to um, how to have these conversations. But what what if what if we didn't need to have as many of those conversations? What if we didn't need to sign post as much? What if we didn't need to spot as many signs, or there weren't as many signs to spot if we were able to prevent the problems in the first place? Now we can't prevent 100% of problems, but I think we can definitely reduce them. So what I'm going to talk to you about this morning are three things I'm going to talk to you about. Number one, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a different way to approach well-being. Some of you 
I'll be preaching to the converted. You'll already know about this, but some of you might not. So it might be relevant. So number one, a different way to think about well-being. Number two, the problems that I see with a reactive approach to workplace well-being. That means waiting for things to go wrong before we do something. And then finally, number three, I'm going to talk to you about what it looks like, preventative wellness in action, what it might look like. And there'll be some ideas in there that hopefully you can steal from me and take back to your workplace and start um, start deploying pretty much straight away because you've already got the resources there. You don't need to spend any more money. You've got the resources. It's just about using things in a different way to how we currently are. So let's jump in then. What is this new or different way of thinking about well-being that I'm talking about? What, what What's it all about? I'm going to show you two um, people and that highlight what I'm talking about here. So these two people are a prime example. We've got Rob on the left, Pete on the right. Just have a quick look at Rob. The sort of things he does, then have a quick look at Pete and see if you can tell me what the difference is between these two people's approach. So just to read out a couple of the bits, Rob, great relationship with his bank. If he needs to extend his overdraft, right, he can speak to his bank manager, sorted. Uh, he's really good at finding balance transfers for when he uh, is, you know, overused his credit card. He buys now and pay later. If he gets in debt, he's got a good relationship with a citizen's advice debt counsellor. And he's quite materialistic. He likes to have a better car than his neighbour, so he regularly changes it. That's Rob. Pete, on the other hand, sets a weekly budget and he draws his cash out every Monday. Because we're talking about financial well-being here. He's got a coach that trains him in new habits. He does a health check every week to look for ways he can save money. 10% of his earnings go into a pot to, to save up for anything he wants. He asks himself that all-important question, do I want this or do I, do I need it, before he buys anything. And he subscribes to a weekly blog to help him learn about finances. So that's Rob. And that's Pete. What I'd like you to do in the chat box, can anyone tell me what the fundamental difference is between Rob and Pete? And again, don't worry about giving me wrong answers or anything like it doesn't matter. But what do you think? OK, Jenny, you're on the ball this morning, young lady. Exactly. Exactly. One is proactive and one is reactive. One is proactive. And again, as Julia's just said there, take preventative measures. So one of them waits. <laughs> Jenny said, don't be like Rob. Yeah, it's not. Rob's not necessarily that bad, but we don't want to be like that all the time. Definitely not. Definitely not. So that's the thing. What it is, one of them, OK, is proactive. He takes preventative action so that he won't fall into financial problems or he's less likely to do so. OK. The other one waits for things to go wrong. He knows the debt counsellor that he can speak to if things go wrong. But his response is based on things going wrong. That's the fundamental problem with that. So as all of you have noticed there, one is proactive, one is reactive. I think, I think though, we can apply this thinking to all aspects of our well-being. And I'm going to highlight this for you in a moment, but we can apply this to all aspects of our well-being. Are we proactive or are we reactive? Are we preventative or are we, we reactive? Now, I'm just going to show you something. And I would like to, again, in a moment, just look at these. There's nine squares on your screen. What do you think these nine squares that I'm going to put on your screen represent? Just have a quick look and I'll, we'll go to the chat box in a moment. Got unhealthy diet, lack of exercise, obesity, smoking, mental stress, excessive alcohol, high blood pressure, high blood sugar and abnormal cholesterol. So just take those nine factors on board. And in a moment, I want you to tell me in the chat box, what do they represent? What do those nine factors represent? So we've got well-being, poor physical health, lack of self-care, most, uh, most common. There's a little bit more to it. They're the nine risk factors for something. What do you think that something is? So we've got stress on there. We've got death. Yep. Sheldon, Sheldon pointing out death. It is. It's actually these are the nine risk factors for 
what's known as ischemic heart disease or coronary heart disease. Uh, when I was a 12 year old boy, my, my dad died of a heart attack. And I would say he had probably none of those risk factors, but that didn't stop it happening. So those nine things you're looking at there are the nine key risk factors for what's called coronary heart disease, a blockage of the supply to the heart, which can lead to pain in the chest, can lead to angina or can lead to heart attacks. All of those nine risk factors, let's just have a look at them again. All nine of those factors are preventable. All nine of the things you're looking at right now are preventable. OK, these are down to how we live our lives for the most part. Not in every single case, but for the most part, all nine of these risk factors are preventable. And it's down to how we live our lives. If we're proactive about how we live our lives, we take that proactive approach, we're less likely to succumb to these things here, okay? And if you take a look at the top right-hand corner, obesity, it's now thought that obesity is more predictive of certain cancers than smoking. You can, you can pop onto Cancer Research's website and they'll even point that out for you. Obesity is now more predictive of certain types of cancers than smoking is. So all of these things we're talking about here, they're all preventable. So it's do we want to be proactive like Pete or do we want to be reactive like Rob? The problem is when we get into a reactive approach, it's harder to get back to where we were before. So that's where I wanted to talk to you about. Just, just to talk to you about the proactive preventative versus reactive. In my experience, and this isn't a blame thing, but I'm saying most organizations take more of a, a reactive approach. That's why, you know, counselling is a first line of defence, counselling when someone has mental health issues. But wouldn't it be great if they were less likely to happen? Big connection between what we eat and our mental health. We can reduce the likelihood of these factors. So a different way of thinking about wellness in the workplace is prevention. The NHS is talking about this now. They realise the only way to resolve these issues is, is prevention, although their version of prevention is more about early detection and vaccinations, whereas mine is about lifestyle. I'm talking about lifestyle, preventing things happening in the first place. So what are the problems then when it comes to a reactive approach? Throw some ideas in the chat box. What do you think are some of the problems with a reactive approach to well-being versus a proactive? How can it go wrong when we follow a reactive approach to well-being? OK, so Julia said the damage is already done. Exactly. The damage is already done. Yep. Health is already damaged from Natalia. Yeah, in some cases, it can be too late, as Jenny said. Yep. Exactly. It's once something's gone wrong. And also, and yeah, thanks, Natalia, as well. Yeah, much harder to change your habits. Definitely. The problem is once something has gone wrong, you always also you lose that person's they they lose quality of life during that period while you're trying to remedy whatever it is, if it's even possible. So they lose quality of life. Their manager loses performance and productivity. The company will, is having to pay uh, for people to be who are off work who aren't uh, aren't working. So everybody loses. Everybody loses when we allow people to fall into that reactive as well. OK, so what I want to share with you is some of the key ideas that I think of why I think a reactive approach is a problem. It's not I don't think there is space for it. I think it just shouldn't be the first option. Prevention should come first. So first of all, what about now? Hopefully you all do the next thing I'm uh, going to show you. Um, hopefully you hopefully you've all even done it this morning. If you haven't done it this morning, well, um, you need to give yourself a smack on the legs. Have you all brushed your teeth today? Good. Right. OK. Now, imagine if we treated our teeth the way we treat our well-being, our health. Imagine if we didn't brush our teeth until we start seeing plaque buildups. We start seeing cracks. We start seeing holes. Our breath starts to absolutely stink. We only brushed our teeth on the days when we saw problems. Imagine that. Now, if anyone suggested that to you, you'd think they were they'd lost their mind. What, I'm only going to brush my teeth when I start to plaque build up and rot and decay and all that stuff. That's that's crazy. Why would you do that? But that is how many of us approach our health and well-being, whether it's our physical, our social, our spiritual, mental, emotional, financial. We only start to act when something's gone wrong. But if that was our teeth, you definitely wouldn't do it. Or at least you wouldn't have very many teeth to to, I guess, to brush if that was your approach. 
So why are we treating our well-being in that way when we wouldn't treat our teeth that way? We brush our teeth and we floss each day to stop the problems happening in the first place. Because once your teeth rotted, it's pretty hard to get them back in tip top condition unless you've got thousands of pounds for veneers or implants or whatever. We brush our teeth and floss our teeth and minimize coffee and uh, and red wine and sugar so we don't get the problems happen. We need to take the same approach when it comes to our well-being, particularly in the workplace. People are spending eight, 10 hours a day at work, maybe more in some cases. There's also now. I think that not only are a lot of organizations not maybe taking action to prevent these problems, but many of them are also facilitating the problems that they want to avoid, facilitating the problems that they want to avoid. Now, this is a really bad place to be because organizations don't knowingly want to make their staff unhealthy, but many things happen in organizations that are facilitating the very problems that lead to absenteeism, presenteeism, staff turnover. I'm going to ask you guys how many of these you're guilty of. Right, I'm going to put some visuals up on the screen for you. And as you look at these visuals, maybe in the chat box in a moment, just make a mental tally. How many of these happen in your organization? So top left corner, I want you to put a tick on your or a tick on your bit of paper. Do you have a vending machine full of junk food, full of sweets, full of fizzy drinks? Give yourself a tick if you put that. Do you have a junk van, I call them the junk wagon, that comes along, that brings along loads of sweets, loads of sugary stuff, loads of wheat-based products, all that sort of stuff, loads of sandwiches um, each day. Give yourself a tick if you put that. Top right corner, does your canteen provide people with loads of beige foods? All of those things, those, those, um, I don't know, sausage rolls, all that sort of stuff, all the samosas, loads of loads of sandwiches, all that. Does your canteen provide loads of beige foods? Bottom left corner, give yourself a tick if you have a culture in your team or in your organization of donuts and cakes for birthdays. Down in the middle as well. Do you have, um, sorry, bottom right corner, reception. Do you have sweets and reception? So every time you walk through reception, you can grab yourself a, uh, grab yourself a sweet. What about your bottom middle one, your training room? When you have training events, when you have training, do you get a platter full of beige foods and crisps and all that stuff that comes in? So they're the six things. When I walk into organizations, I always see these things. There's the culture of donuts for birthdays. There's beige foods in the canteen. There's beige foods in training. There's a junk wagon. There's vending machines. There's sweets in reception. Problem with all this is it's in giving people the ability to mess with their blood sugar. And this is at the heart of so many of our health problems because it all starts from there. It all starts from our ability to mess with our blood sugar. Never before in the, hum the history of humankind have you been able to mess with your blood sugar like you can today. And it's creating havoc on our health. So in the chat box, how many out of six did you score? Did you get none out of six? If so, I guess none out of six is a great score. If you got two, if you got three, if you got six. Okay. Okay, some interesting scores there then. Now, what we're doing here, remember, what's happening here is we are, by doing those things, we are facilitating the very thing we want to avoid. As I just said to you a moment ago, remember, uh, obesity is, which is classed as, I guess, being over a BMI of over 30, obesity is more predictive of certain cancers than smoking now. And how do we gain weight very quickly? Eat foods that mess with your blood sugar. Eat foods that mess with your blood sugar. If you want to gain weight, eat foods that mess with your blood sugar. And never before in the history of humankind could you have been able to do this like we can today with all of these foods. All of the stuff I just showed you on screen, if you want someone to gain weight and get very unhealthy, put those foods in front of them. And they'll become overweight and unhealthy very, very quickly. So I'm glad that some of the scores were low, some ones, some zeros. That's great to hear. For those of you who got high scores, don't give yourself a smack, smack, smack legs or anything like that. It's just to make you aware. It might be causing the very problems that you want to avoid. It might be causing the problems that lead to absenteeism, presenteeism, staff turnover, all of those things. Another problem then with the reactive approach is at best, if you do a really good job of the reactive approach with the counseling and all those things, at best, 
things stay exactly as they are. You've just put out the fire. You're not getting better. You've just put out the fire. OK, so that problem could have escalated. You've just put out the fire. You haven't improved. You've just stayed exactly as you are. If the reactive approach works. All right. We've just managed to put out all of those fires, but we haven't moved further in any other sense. So in my opinion, and this is for what it's worth, the reactive approach should just be for everyone who falls through the preventative net. I'll just repeat that for the people who fall through your preventative net. That's what the reactive approach should be. The counseling services, all those things for when people fall through the net. So how do we do this then? How do we put this in action? How do we harness the power of preventative wellness in the workplace? I'll, I'll, I'll give you some ideas now and feel free to scribble these ideas, steal some ideas from me if you think they're useful. Um, I'm sure you probably many of you are already doing them, but if not, feel free to borrow these ideas. Number one, what we have to stop doing is this is this atomistic approach to well-being. OK, we need to think holistically. We're too atomistic when it comes to to well-being. And that means what I mean by that is talking about mental health in terms of just the brain, as opposed to all the other factors that influence our mental health. It's Mental Health Awareness Week, isn't it? And movement is a key part of this year's theme. So it's highlighting the fact that how you move your body influences the mind because you can't separate mind and body. What you do to your mind influences your, your body and what you do with your body influences your mind. You can't separate them. So businesses have to move away from this, just reducing things down to mental health is the brain because that leaves two options, counselling and antidepressants or medication, which they're fine, but there's more to it than that. There's more to it. So we have to think more broadly and I'll give you some examples of what I mean by this broader thinking, because all of these there's various factors that interplay with each other when it comes to our well-being. And once you're aware of them, it becomes much easier to start thinking in terms of in terms of prevention. So just have a quick look at that on your screen from Stanford Metabolic Psychiatry Unit. So essentially, people with mental health issues are more likely to have physical health issues and people with physical health issues are more likely to have mental health issues. It's because the connection is what's known as our metabolic health. Metabolism happens in the body and in the brain. It's your metabolic health. This all comes down to lifestyle here. So much in terms of mental health is linked to what you eat. A lot of people aren't aware that the ketogenic diet, which is getting a lot of popularity now, was around over 100 years ago because it prevents seizures. People who follow that diet were able to prevent seizures while they're on a ketogenic diet. But it's got way more benefits than that. But essentially, physical and mental cannot be separated. If you have mental health issues, you're more likely to have the physical health issues on your screen there. How about this one? type 3 diabetes. So we're talking about poorly controlled blood sugar here. And again, what, what, what your blood sugar is influenced by the things you eat, particularly the carbohydrates you eat. Protein and fats, protein influences your blood sugar slightly and fats minimally, but it's carbohydrates. So all those six things I just had on your screen a moment ago, they massively influence your blood, blood sugar. So we're starting to think of it as type 3 diabetes connected to Alzheimer's through what we're eating. So again, lifestyle, physical, mental, we can't separate these things out. They're all interlinked. How about this one? Now, I typically think of work, meaningful work and purpose. I mean, that's less spiritual factors. That's meaning and engagement. These are the spiritual factors in your life. So, again, we're connecting the spiritual with the mental as well. There's so many things that link. How about this one for the social and the mental?
So there's connections between all of these factors. That's why I think in workplaces, got to move away from this reductionist mental health is about the brain. The brain plays a part, but so does your financial situation. So does your relationship. So does your physical health. There's so much connection between um, finances, your finances and your mental health as well. Finances. Check out this one here. Debt is positively associated with depression. If any of you out there have been in debt before, you'll know the, the way that can affect your mind and your mood, which could also affect your physical you know, ability to buy healthy foods, all these sort of things, you know, they're all interlinked. So we have to move away from this uh, atomistic thinking and think holistically, connect all of these factors together. Because I'm going to share you an example in a moment of how this works in in the real world, preventive wellness in the real world. And I think this will we all remember the COVID experience that we had in 2020. Um, Meals on Wheels. You've all heard of Meals on Wheels. Well, there was some research done in the Journal of the American Medical Association called JAMA, the uh, psych psychiatry division. And what they looked at was they wanted to find out if you could what the connection was between loneliness, isolation and mental health okay so and relationships so what they did they found uh 240 people who are elderly who they thought would be at risk during covid at risk of being lonely at risk of depression link a uh, risk of anxiety and they they got a group of uh young students about 16 of them to watch a video for an hour on how to have conversations with people, how to check in and say, how are you doing, Mrs. Smith or Mr. Smith? And they wanted to know, does this regular weekly phone call, will it reduce scores of loneliness, anxiety and depression? So what they did, they re they assessed all of the 240 people for loneliness, anxiety and depression using standard uh, psychological scales. And they found that just by having these young people, these potentially teenagers, ring them up for a quick chat of about 10 minutes each week and say, how are you doing during COVID? They were able to achieve a reduction in the scores. Just have a look at the outcomes there, the conclusions from that. That's preventative wellness at work. That's preventative wellness in action. These people weren't, uh, hadn't been diagnosed with anxiety or depression. They were just at risk for it. And by that intervention, by ringing them up and checking in, they were able to reduce the scores at the end of the at the end of the assessment. They're able to bring those scores down. Now I shared this with a client of mine, um, a company that I've been working with for a number of years during COVID, and they did this. They uh, they turned their mental health first aid team into proactive service and they had them ring all of the people who were furloughed. OK, so every Friday, the mental health first aid team got a list of numbers and names and they rang them to check in with these people because they were they were furloughed. They were on home. Many of them, uh, they've got a high population of men who are over the age of 50, a lot of engineers. And so a lot of them and a lot of them living on their own. And they were able to the, the feedback they got from making those calls was unbelievable. The fact that people felt appreciated, noticed, connected. Now, they didn't measure in terms of absence levels before and after, which would have made a great case study. But the the subjective responses that came back were phenomenal. I didn't realize that my company cared about me so much. Wow, it feels good to be recognized. All sorts of feedback that just shows if you take that proactive, preventive approach, you can have a massive impact. And it doesn't cost anything else. It doesn't cost anything different to what you're already spending. So bringing this all this together, what we tend to use, and this is a tool, please feel free to steal this as well. But this is the tool we use um, based on our thinking around the subject of, of well-being. We call this the preventative wellness wheel. And this is based on all of my years working well-being and from the research that we've done. These are the six factors. If you want to take preventative wellness seriously, these are the six factors, the six wellness zones you have to act in. OK, the red zone, mental. That's how your mind performs, your type of thought, your your mental clarity, your memory, emotional. That's your mood, your stability of your mood, natural fluctuations based on external events and, and thoughts. Physical, that's your your fitness, your strength, your, your BMI, your metabolic health. 
Remember, there's that word again, metabolic health. It's the heart of everything. Financial, your financial security. It's your your financial flexibility, you know, the ability to weather the storm when things go a bit wrong. Social, that's your connectedness, your strength of your support networks, your feeling, sense of belonging. Spiritual, that's your belief systems. It's your sense of purpose in life, your meaning, uh, your causes that you feel passionate about. Once all of these six zones are in a good place, individuals will be in a good place. So that means the individual gets quality of life. That means the manager gets productivity and performance. That means the company saves money on having to pay people to not be in work. OK, everybody wins when we focus on this. So we've even moved away from talking about mental health, physical health. We talk about wellness because this is wellness that you're looking at right now. This is how people thrive in their lives because we want people are stagnating at the moment, but we don't want them to stagnate. We want them to thrive. And what you're looking at here is how people thrive. Can you see at the top? It says biopsychosocial. So some of these factors are biological. You know, we're talking about our, our our physical health. Some of them are psychological, mental, and emotional, um, spiritual, and some of them are social, the social one and financial. So this is because when you look in the world of mental health, the model that explains what causes mental health problems, it says that some of the things are biological, some of the things are psychological, and some of them are sociological. So we've flipped that on its head and said, well, okay, if it's biopsychosocial, what causes it? Maybe it can be biopsychosocial, what prevents it? And that's why we use these factors at all levels in the business. This is the, the model. And I think if you take care of all these six ideas, these areas, you will find you'll be able to perform much better in your business. Now, your EAP, I'm sure most of you have got an EAP. Your EAP can offer proactive, preventative coaching. So I'm not talking about counselling here. Counselling is reactive. Coaching for mental, coaching on mindfulness, meditation, coaching around things like um, physical, personal trainers, nutritionists, coaching on financial habits, coaching on life coaches that can help people develop better relationships, develop purpose and meaning in the life. You already have all of the services there in your business. It's just about flipping that and using them for proactive coaching purposes as opposed to just reactive purposes. But these are the six essential zones if you want to do that. So that's the preventive wellness wheel. Please steal it. Please contact me if you want me to share any more ideas about how it works. I'm always happy to chat chat with people just to so you can know how to do it in your business. That's the preventative wellness wheel. Let's look at it in action then. What's this going to look like when we're actually doing some more of this stuff? I talked about the the mental health first aid is making the calls. That's a prime example. But when we're doing this, we need to be thinking about three levels of your business. You can't just work at the individual level. You can't just work at team level. You can't just work at the senior management level. It has to be all three levels. And when we work with businesses, we create something called the Preventative Wellness Project. It involves all three of those levels. And here's, here's how it works. So you have to start, or in our expert, you start with the senior management, okay, senior management on board. And what we're looking to do, once we've got the senior management on board, everything becomes easier, obviously, it's finding out three things. So it's three levels, senior management, line managers, and individuals, and then it's finding out three things. What are you doing that's having a negative impact operationally on your employees? So if we were to look at physical, we would have the senior management in a room. OK, physical, what are you doing operationally that's having a negative impact on your on your your employees physically? You can see all those things around the circle. They're the behaviors that the company influences and the things in the box are the outputs. You probably all heard the term garbage in, garbage out, that computer science term. So on those things around the green circle. If the behaviors around that are poor, the things in the, the gray box will be poor. Garbage in, garbage out. So what is a company doing that's having a negative impact on people physically? Are they expecting people not to take breaks? That would have a negative impact on their movement, wouldn't it? Which would have an impact on the box. Are we um, expecting people to work all sorts of ridiculous shifts? That's gonna influence their sleep behaviors. 
which will influence the bots. So we want the senior leaders to identify in all six of the wellness zones, what are we doing that's having a negative impact operationally? Then what are we doing that's having a positive impact on the physical? Because we want to do more of that. And then finally, we ask them, what about new ideas? What could you bring in that's going to have a positive preventive impact on them? So that's how we work with the senior managers. And if you can get your senior managers on board with this, identifying the things to stop doing, to start doing and new ideas, then it comes down to a team level. A manager will work with the whole team and we ask them, OK, what's going on in your team culture that's having a negative impact physically? And it might be the case that, well, actually, as a manager, I'm always asking people to be uh, checking emails at 10 o'clock at night time or I'm expecting them to pick up the phone at seven in the morning that would have a negative impact on their work work life balance, which again is going to negatively influence the box. So it's just about working through this at the, the senior management level, the line manager level, and then finally teaching individuals how to change their habits, which is very easy to do. Once you know the mechanics of habits, it becomes very easy to do. OK, so again, it's working at six zones of the wellness wheel. At three levels, senior manager, line manager, individual, and just find out what are we doing that's having a negative impact? So we need to stop it. Or what are we doing that's having a positive pre preventative impact? And what new ideas could we introduce? And that's how it works in, pro in, in reality, okay? It's about finding those things, identifying the problem spots, introducing new preventative things, and that's what allows us to, will allow organization to move forward. It's just about grabbing the helm of your ship and reorienting it away from reactive towards proactive, preventative. So that means senior managers are thinking proactively, preventively. Line managers, individuals, your mental health first aiders are thought of as a proactive service now rather than reactive. Your EAP, you're using the coaching in your EAP to teach people habits around certain areas. Proactive, preventative rather than reactive that's what we're looking at doing at the moment so for example if you're going to have a monthly campaign you could just pick one of the areas of the the wellness wheel pick one of the areas and think actually this month we'd like to focus on financial that aspect of our wellness that is financial you look at one of the inputs okay we're going to focus on saving contact your eap ask them for a load of um podcasts and webinars that they've got and just distribute them about the business have a newsletter that focuses on saving line managers in meetings could check in with their team and ask them about any new behaviors and individuals through the podcast the newsletter and the webinars could choose behaviors that they want to translate into their habits and that's how it would work each month just moving to a different zone of the wheel Give each zone two visits a year and you will find that over time you're changing people's behaviors towards preventative rather than reactive. So the two gentlemen in the, the slide I showed you at the start, we're moving towards being like Pete, proactive Pete rather than reactive. It's just about that gradual, gradual behavior change over time. So it's what would you think about now then is just how do you how do you make this happen in your business then what are you going to do going to do differently because it's very easy to follow the annual well-being calendar but i think a lot of organizations are probably doing too much and that's why it's not getting the return it's probably about doing less using the resource you've got to do less but doing it more effectively so maybe not following every aspect of the well-being calendar but just focus on these six zones we've got and that's a more targeted approach understanding the things we want to make changes on that's most important because remember mental health musculoskeletal and general uh, illness were the top three reasons for absence and remember absence is the highest it's been in uh in 10 years so well-being a health related absence is the highest it's been in 10 years so just to bring things to a close then just to recap we started off by talking about a different way of approaching well-being that's proactive, preventative rather than reactive. We talked about um, the problems with the reactive approach that you only ever stay as you are. It's never going to bring those scores down. OK, and then finally, we talked about it in action, 
these identifying these areas at, at three levels, senior management, line management, individual, weeding out the things that are causing people problems, keeping doing the things that are having a preventative effect and adding in new ideas. And then over time, focusing on prevention in your monthly campaigns as you move forward. So that brings us to a close. I just want you to think about this as you go forward. It's a new way of thinking about well-being. Prevention is a new way, but it's definitely the smart way. It won't cost you more. In fact, it'll probably cost you less. You'll save money. You've already got the mental health first aiders. You've got the EAP. You've got it all there with all the services. It's just about taking the helm of your ship away from heading towards reactive island towards preventative island. And that's going to, I think that's going to be the thing that makes a change. So just finish with one final question. And just to highlight what I'm talking about here, you have to answer this question for yourself now. Do you want to focus on developing the world's greatest fire brigade? OK, brilliant at firefighting. Or do you want to be the one on the right and just focus on having less fires? So world's greatest fire brigade or less fires. That's the choice you have to make in terms of your organizational, organizational well-being strategy. I think the less fires makes more sense, but that's just my opinion.